Hey everyone, and welcome to a video on how we can think about the risk neutral probability measure in quantitative finance. So most people are probably familiar with the risk neutral probability measure. We use that to price various instruments in financial markets. And a lot of people know the mathematical formalism that comes with this concept. Not as many people know the actual intuitive side of it, like why we introduce this and how it's introduced. So I wanted to take a few minutes to just go over an illustrative example on this to make it clear what the risk neutral probability actually represents. So let's have a look at the following example that's going to illustrate it for us. We imagine that we have some financial instrument here and we want to price that in the market. And we assume that two outcomes could happen in a real market Normally, there would be an infinite set of outcomes that could happen, but for simplicity now, let's consider two. Either it goes up to a price of SA, let's say that's 1.07, but it doesn't really matter. And then it could also go down. So then we would end up at SB with a probability or with a value of 0.96. Let's say we're considering one day here as well for the time interval. So T goes from zero to one, okay? And we want to price this now. So the instrument is not in the market yet, but we want to figure out what is the fair price of this instrument. So if I asked you, what are you willing to pay for this? Probably the first thing you would come back with is what is the probability of each of these outcomes? If the probability of this outcome being is very high, then you would probably be willing to pay close to this price. And if this has a very high likelihood, then you would probably be inclined to pay close to this value, right? So normally you don't know the probabilities that the price goes either up or down, but you could use different modeling techniques to come up with an approximation of that. And let's say for the sake of argument that we have this probability. So let's say that with probability PA, the price is going to go up and then consequently with probability one minus PA, it's going to go down to this value here. Again, these would need to be modeled, but let's assume that I give them to you now and say, this is, this is the way it is. And then I ask you, what would you be willing to pay for this instrument? I might suggest that you can buy it for the expectation value. So that would be probability of the price going up times the price if it actually goes up plus one minus probability that it goes up times the price if it goes down, right? If I gave you that offer, would you take it? Most likely you would say no. You should say no for two reasons. Firstly, there is no discounting here. And we know that money depreciates over time. So a dollar in 1950, let's say, would be worth more than it is today. And we need to take that effect into account. Normally that's done via a discount factor like this. So exponential times some, um, well, rate of um, depreciation and then times the time, right? Um, so fine, let me throw that in there for completeness. Over one day, that's not going to have a very material effect, but nevertheless, uh, let me put that in there anyway. I ask you again now, would you be willing to buy this instrument for, for the price that I've outlined here? Most likely, your answer will again be no. And the reason for that is, if you're anything like the market, at least, you're going to be risk averse. What that means is the market depreciates the value of instruments that have some uncertainty tied to them. The market would rather buy an instrument that gives you 100% certainty of the outcome than something where you don't really know the outcome, even if it has, in some cases, a higher payoff than, um, than the one that you know for certain. So we know that in the market, provided that the market is risk averse, the actual price as zero here is going to be smaller than this discounted expectation value. And that's kind of a shame because that seemingly throws out, uh, throws out the way that we could evaluate this instrument. It would have been very neat if we could price the instrument like this because it would give us a very natural expression for how to evaluate the asset price. Nevertheless, we know, so this approach doesn't really work, but what we can say is that the price S0 is going to be somewhere between SA and SB, right? So that we know for sure, unless there is some arbitrage in the market, but we're going to assume that's not the case. So in that case, the starting price is going to be between these two values, at least if we neglect the discount term here. The value that we would get from this weighted average here is also somewhere in between SA and SB. We just figured out that these points are not go going to coincide, but at least both of these values will be in the range between SA and SB. 
And depending on what this value p here is, the value that we get from, from this expression would go from either sa if we set pa to be 1, all the way down to sb if we set pa to be 0. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because regardless of what s0 actually is, there's always going to be some value p that we can find which makes them coincide. So there's going to be some p tilde that if we plug it into this equation is going to mean that the value here is s0. Now, we don't know s0 yet. That's what we're trying to figure out, right? So we can't really use this to solve for p tilde, but nevertheless, we know that there should be some p tilde that corresponds to this value, right? Okay, so if we have that, let's imagine that we could find this p tilde. In that case, we could write this on the very simple form that we had before. So then S0 would be some discounting times some expectation value. Now, the probability that we have in this expectation value is not the actual probability because we figured out before that that's not going to coincide with the starting price. But we can think of P tilde as some probability because it's going to be in the range of 0 to 1. So it satisfies the necessary criteria for a probability. It doesn't correspond to the actual probability that we would see in the real world, but it is some probability. And therefore, we can write this as some expectation under another probability measure uh, is what the formal name of this is. And therefore, we can write it on this form, provided that we know what p tilde is. But the problem now is we don't have p tilde, right? But if we knew this market-dependent number, we would be able to price these instruments in this very simple form. And imagine now that we were actually trying to do this. So imagine that we had this instrument and we have the market at our disposal and we want to price or we want to assess what the fair price of this instrument would be if we put it into the market. What we could do is we could look at instruments with similar characteristics. So let's say there is another instrument already in the market that has a similar payoff tomorrow. So similar probabilities of going up or down and similar values if it goes up and down. If we look at, for that instrument, we have the price today, right? So technically speaking, we could plug that instrument into this equation and find out what P tilde would be. So if we look at a similar instrument, we could construct the same equation and then solve for P tilde. And if we do that, we're gonna be able to use that P tilde for our instrument and plug that into this equation. And by looking at similar instruments in the market, we can therefore assess what the, this P tilde or this fictional probability would be and in that way, once we've figured out what this value is, we can plug it into this equation and then assess what the instrument is going to be. And that seems like a, a tedious way of getting to the answer here. Uh, we could have just compared the instrument to similar instruments in the market from the beginning and then came up with a price. But the strength of this approach is if you do that for the entire market. So let's assume now that you look at all the different instruments that are uh, taking place in the market and you look at what this P tilde would come out to be for varying spreads here and also varying time intervals and varying starting prices. If you did that and mapped out the entire market, what you would end up with is another set of probabilities. And if you have a new instrument that you want to put in place in the market, you could look at the corresponding P tilde for that instrument and price it with this kind of formulation. And that is exactly what the risk neutral probability measure is. So. What we do when we construct the risk prob neutral probability measure is we look at the market and figure out what these fictional probabilities are that would give us this easy way of pricing instruments. That's how the risk neutral probability measure can be defined. And so that gives you a natural way of thinking about the risk neutral probability measure. It doesn't actually correspond to an actual probability that we would see in the real world, but it is the measure at which this equation holds. And if we are able to transform into that probability measure, it gives us a very easy way to price instruments. And that's exactly why we construct it. And the strength is you only need to do this once. So you only need to figure out what the risk neutral probability is once. And then you can use that measure to price all instruments in a very simple way. And that's the reason why we construct it in the way we do. And that's the reason why solving for asset prices in that measure is very simple. So that's it for this quick video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.